Jesus is our vicarious sacrifice. He took our place, bearing our yoke. So what should have come to us as slaves was now put upon Christ. When a man and woman are joined, there is no stronger, stronger representation of that scripture. Where the Bible says, if two or three shall agree as touching anything, there is no stronger representation of that scripture than marriage. No stronger representation. This is why even in law, the law of Nigeria, if a marriage has not been consummated, that they have not had sexual relations, they will not consider it that they have been bound. Because in the marital union, one of the ways that the joining, the gluing, takes place between husband and wife is through sexual intimacy. So if that sexual intimacy has not occurred, the law will say that the marriage has not been consummated and it can be declared null and void. Because that thing is covenant. This is why we preach against fornication the way we preach against fornication. Sex is a joiner. It's one of the glues designed by God to highlight that covenant between man and wife. And this is why God hates adultery. He hates it. Because adultery speaks of unfaithfulness to covenant. He places adultery in the same place that he places idolatry. They are the same thing. In the eyes of God. Because it means that you cannot be faithful. You are sharing what should be for one person with a multitude of partners. God wanted to so mirror this importance that he had to tell a prophet. He used a prophet's life as a teaching syllabus in Hosea. He told him to go and marry a harlot. And then he was using that relationship to now instruct the children of Israel. Can God now tell you to go and marry an unbeliever? No. Somebody might ask why. Because the Bible says that there is no fellowship between light and darkness. A Christian does not marry an unbeliever. No. If you were unbelievers and then you got married and then you now got born again, is different. But you come and you say, God is directing me to marry this brother, and the brother is an unbeliever. God won't do that. Because the Bible is clear. What fellowship does light have with darkness? There's no point of agreement. And two cannot work together except they be agreed. The base point for your meeting anybody, before you will even consider anybody a wife or husband material, the person should first of all be a child of God first. And we emphasized this yesterday when we said that Abraham told his servant, he said, go to my kindred. Don't take a wife from Isaac, from this, for Isaac from these Canaanite women. That is how Christians marry. We don't marry from Canaan. We don't marry, marry from Moab. We don't marry from Babylon. We don't marry from Sodom. If a Zionite wants to marry, you must also marry another Zionite. That's how we operate. Are we together to that point? So, because marriage by covenant is very powerful, God now says that once you have entered, you can't get out. You are bound for life. You are glued to that partner. That's what it means to cleave. You are glued to that partner. You are one with that partner. You are one. I remember one time I was about to pray for people who were trusting God for marriage. And the Lord began to speak to me. He said, some of these sisters you are seeing standing here, they are already married. And I was wondering, why? Why? And I said it as the Lord told me. It's later I understood that because some of them were already having sexual intercourse with people that were not their partners, in the realm of the spirit, they were no longer single. They had become one with a man. So they are already married in the spirit. One with a man. That's how powerful that sex thing is. It's a glue. Lord give you understanding. <laughs> so once you are joined to someone, Jesus said, man cannot put asunder what God has joined together. So it is God that does the joining. 
He's the one that causes you to cleave. So the covenant is not just words that you speak. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. Or even if you write your own vows, you can write your own vows. And you promise that you are going to be with this person for the rest of your life. The Bible says that God said, I am witness between you and the wife of your youth. In fact, he says she is the wife of your covenant. That's what is in the Bible. The wife of your covenant. So in the sight of God, those two are joined. To separate it, God said the only way that that thing can be broken is by death. That's what the Bible says. So when somebody comes and now says, marriage is no longer forever, because that's what that thing means. When somebody is telling you that divorce is not a sin, God does not like divorce, but divorce is not a sin. What that person is telling you is that marriage is no longer forever. Marriage is no longer sacred, and marriage is no longer binding. There are two things I hope to achieve tonight before we enter into questions. Okay, evangelist, if I'm now in a bad marriage, what do I do? Am I sentenced to death? I will try and answer that when I finish laying my foundation. What if I've already made a mistake? What do I do? It might be your cross to carry, but I will try and answer that. And this is why we are deliberately, intentionally opening you up now, especially those of you that are single, that these matters are not jokes. They are not jokes. If you've seen the effect of a broken home on children, if you've seen the effect of a broken home on society, you will understand why God holds marriage in such sacred terms. If you've seen it. If you've ever met people who are living anyhow, and you trace it back and find out that they came from a scattered home, or from homes that were polygamous and filled with all kinds of strange things, you will now understand why God said it should be one man and one woman. So, I feel that part of the reason God gave us this thing forever or not is that let's settle it as believers. Is marriage forever? Because I heard a preacher say that in every other thing, God has given people a second chance. Why not marriage? Why not marriage? For the preacher, it is difficult to, to agree with God on this matter. You should know that God is not a man. He doesn't think like the way we think. You cannot use your human perspective to analyze God's God the way he is. It may not make sense to you, but he is God. He's the author of the marriage. He says, this is the way I want it operated. So you, your job is to align. Who is the clay to tell to the potter, make me like this? You don't have that locus. You don't. If God gives second chances on other matters, this is why he counsels you from the beginning. That in marriage, look at the way it was done at the beginning and follow that template. Follow that template. Be a Christian. and teachers be a Christian. And make sure that who you marry, uncle, is a Christian. Christians. Because most of the time, the problem is that many of us in the Christian space, we are fake we are not true believers. We are not true Christians. And this year for me has been a very, very, a, a, a shock with reality on many fronts. Many fronts. That you, you, me and my wife were shocked to find out that a woman can raise her hand. Eh? and put a knock on her husband's head. Yes. And because the man is a Christian, Christian man, he didn't get angry. He didn't raise his hand to say, I will kill you. And the reason the woman can do that thing is because she knows that the man is truly a believer. If you don't say your husband a confra, when you fold your hand into, into the knock like this, Satan will advise you not try ammo. <laughs> he 
is Satan, Satan. The same Satan that is telling you, do your hand like this. He will advise you quickly. Say, no press the Kong for your head. Oh. <laughs> say, just swam, just swam, but not use ammo. Satan will advise you because Satan knows that it will not end well. Satan knows it won't end well. But Satan will allow you to do that thing to your husband because he knows that he's a true Christian. Then you will put a knock on his head. And the man will just say, Glory. He won't shout. He won't fight. He won't do anything. Because he loves God. You see, marry a believer. Somebody might be saying so because I'm a Christian, I should take all kinds of abuse. We will deal with that matter. When a marriage becomes physically abusive, do I need to enjoy it and die in the abuse? No, that's not what Jesus is saying. No. You will not be able to divorce, so, but you can take a place of safety and stay there. If God heals the man and things work, be praying for him that he will come to his senses or be praying for her. Because physical abuse in marriage is not just from the man alone. Even women physically abuse their husbands. I know a man. I don't want to say more than that because he's very sensitive. And I know how far my messages travel. I know a man that when he does something, his wife will call the children. I'm telling you a life story. To hold his leg and hold his hand. His own children. And then she will release belt. I'm telling you life story. If the man shouts, say, don't shout, don't shout. Some brothers want to die where they are saying, if you say, e -e -e -e. may God not allow you. See, this is why, this is why, be careful that the sister does, go, go. You better go and pray and let God show you her true, her true state in the spirit. You better pray. The Bible says, it's the Lord that brought the woman to Adam. Share you see that Adam was so comfortable in the will of God for him that even when Eve was making a mistake, Adam was by her side. Are you with me? She took of the fruit and ate and gave to her husband who was with her. He was there. He was there. When they drove them out of the garden, it's him and his wife that went to bear that punishment together. They were comrades together. Partners in crime. Just partner. They were together. Together. So first thing we need to do is let's settle this matter first. How does God deal with issues of divorce in the Bible? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 32. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 32. We'll just run through scriptures quickly. The time is running. But I say to you, remember, it is Jesus that is speaking. Jesus. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason, except sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever... And whoever marries a woman who is divorced, commits what? Where do people who are adulterers go when they die? I'm not hearing you. Adultery does not change because we are now discussing divorce. Is adultery a sin? So if Jesus is saying that if you divorce somebody except for sexual immorality, you are causing the person to become an adulterer. An adultery is a sin. Then what, what then is divorce? Don't answer. Write your answer in your note. Write it in your note. What then? He says, he that marries a woman who is divorced is in black and white. 
So, the implication of this is even if the person divorced because the partner committed adultery, eh, you are still not permitted to remarry. It's not me. Forget about me now. Read, read, read the scripture yourself. Whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits what? The Bible didn't say he whoever marries a woman who is divorced because of no divorce is divorce. Whether you were divorced because your husband was unfaithful, or you were divorced because of whatever reason, say that the man was not mature. When we got married, we were baby Christians, we didn't really know anything about marriage. So I suffered many things in the marriage, so I decided I will not marry again. And I now divorced. The Bible says, in that state that you are, if you go and remarry, in the eyes of heaven, you are a what? Adulterer. Is the Bible. Not Kesena is it. The Bible. Luke chapter 16. Give me 14 to 18. Let's read it in New King James first. Then we'll read it in NLT. Now, the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard all these things and they derided him. Next verse. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows what? Your heart. For what is highly esteemed among men is a what? Abomination. Where? In the sight of God. Next verse. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is what? What does he say next? And it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than one title of the law to what? Next verse. Whoever. Are you seeing the progression? That's why I began from that place. So you know how he concluded here. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits what? And whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits what? Go back to verse 14. Give us NLT. You will see the way NLT will break it down very sweetly. The Pharisees who dearly loved their money heard all this and scoffed at him. Then he said to them, you like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. What this word honors is what? Detestable before God. It's an abomination. So, um, um, this man is on his fifth wife. This woman is on her 17th husband. This preacher is on his 21st. <clears throat> and that preacher is on his 89th. Mm -hmm. So, if you say all those ones are sinners and God is using them mightily, what do you call being used of God? What do you call being used of God? The children of Israel stood there and saw Moses strike the rock and water flowed. And they were singing and dancing, but heaven put an end to a man's destiny. God was not pleased. What do you call being used by God? It's when we die, we will know whether God will tell us, welcome thou good and faithful servant. It's when we die. So that men are doing it. He says, what this world honors is detestable. God detests it. It's an abomination. Go for that. 16. Until John the Baptist, follow closely, the law of Moses and the messages of the prophets were your what? Guides. But now, the good news of the kingdom is preached and everyone is eager to get in. 17. But that does not mean that the law has lost its what? So the law is still at work. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the smallest point of God's law to be what? Overturned. Next verse. For example, are you here? A man who divorces his wife and marries someone else commits what? And anyone who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits what? This is an example that the law is still at work, is still in force. It doesn't matter what a preacher says. This is the Bible. 
1 Corinthians 7. Let's read from verse 1. If you are still with me tonight, say amen. amen. 1 Corinthians 7 from verse 1. Because in the mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter is established. So let's put one more scripture. Now, concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So, the context for this entire chapter is like what we do with Q&A. They sent a question to Paul, and Paul is responding to their questions. Are we good to that point? Verse 2. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Verse 3. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. Verse 4. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Keep going. We are going to 16. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Keep going. But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. Seven. For I wish that all men, even, all men were even as myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. Are you following the flow so far? The question they would have sent to Paul, remember that the Corinthian church was a heavily spiritual church, but it was also a heavily carnal church. Immoral. It's the Corinthian church that Paul said that the kind of immorality we are seeing amongst you, we don't even see it among unbelievers. Immoral church. So, in matters, he was saying that it is good that a man should not touch a woman. But if you know that you cannot stay, everybody should have their own wife. Everybody should have their own husband. So that this immorality that we are hearing amongst you, we will no longer be hearing it. Right? But he was saying that those of you that are not married, don't be under pressure to get married. I wish you all were like me. And we dealt with this yesterday, verse 32 to 35. Where it now began to show that the virgin, her focus is on Jesus. The married woman, her attention is on how to please her husband. So that's where we are. Next verse. Nine, nine, nine. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Ten. Now to the married. So you see, he has dealt with the singles now. Who is he talking to now? The married. I command, yet not I, but who commands? The Lord. So this is a commandment from who? The Lord. So Paul is ref referencing the Lord. He's referencing Jesus. He's referencing the Father. He's referencing the Holy Spirit. But when you read scriptures, you will know that Lord is used for Jesus. Lord is used for the Father. Lord is used for the Holy Ghost. We don't have time for that now. Now, he says, a wife. Look at how he begins. Oh. You remember that during the singles program, Pastor Oji raised the matter and I countered it. And I want to show you why I countered it. He says, a wife is not to depart from her husband. Is that in black and white? Should we translate it to Urubo? Um, Ayopopo. <laughs> look, look at the power of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> look at the power, the power. Whether I speak English or Robo, there's anointing. Okay. A wife is not to depart from her husband. No reason given. No, no clause put there. The first thing is, he says, this is a commandment from the Lord. Do not depart from your husband. First is the first thing. Don't, 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 a wife is the same for a husband. A husband should not depart from his wife. Next verse. But even if she does depart, let her remain what? Is that in your Bible? Or let her do what? Reconcile. This is the Bible. 
And a husband is not to divorce his wife. So Paul is saying, don't think I'm only speaking to the wife now. This is the same thing for the husband. If you now say, I want to the battle, um, I, I, I entered the marriage and I found out that he doesn't know how to manage money. My God, I can't suffer like this. I, I'm too much for this. Um, I'm no longer in love with him. He says, let her remain what? Married. It's not me. Don't, don't, don't put me inside the matter. My own, I'm a messenger. He said, let her remain unmarried or what? Be reconciled. That's scripture. Next verse. But to the rest, I, not who? The Lord. I say, if any brother who has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. Now, you know this is the matter we are trying to talk about yesterday. Now, you are a Christian, but you are married to somebody who is an unbeliever. Paul is saying, if the unbeliever is willing to stay who, don't divorce. That's what he's saying. If she is willing to stay with you, don't divorce her. Next verse. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not what? Divorce him. Why? For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children will be unclean, but now they are what? Now, an error has come out from this place that if an unbeliever is married to a believer, because the woman is a believer, that what Paul means here by being sanctified is that the man is now born again. That's wrong. That's not what that scripture is saying. He's saying that the man is set apart because the original order. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. The original order is that the man is the priest in the home. Right? He's the priest. That word sanctification, that's priesthood language. He's the priest in the home. So he is supposed to be providing spiritual covering for the home. But because the man is not born again, if it's a case of the man not being a born again, and the woman being born again because the man is not born again and the woman is born again she now takes the place of the spiritual authority in the home now creating an atmosphere that will not allow satan to infiltrate that home and carry out his agenda in that home her priesthood now provides a covering a separation remember this sanctification means being separated so even her husband and her children can now come under the spiritual atmosphere that she generates, even if the man is not a believer. And vice versa is the case. If the man is a believer and the wife is not, he too can sanctify the wife. She can become a partaker in what she should not, not normally enjoy because someone is creating the favorable atmosphere for God to invade. Do we understand it? Next verse. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. What does Paul mean when he says she's not under bondage? She doesn't need to force the marriage to continue. She doesn't. But does that mean that she can go and remarry? No. Go to verse 30. Is it 30 I'm looking for? Thirty-nine. A wife is bound by law as long as her what? Her husband lives. This is how we concluded this matter. A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes only where? In the law. So it must be a believer. Go to verse 40. But she is happier if she remains as she is according to who? My own judgment. He is now saying, well, but for me, oh, according to the Lord, she's bound. Oh. If the man is still living, she's bound. She cannot remarry. But for me, oh, I will not even be thinking about remarrying because I'll be happier. And I think I also have what? 
So this was why I said during the singles meeting that even if the unbeliever leaves, the Christian cannot go and remarry as long as that unbeliever is still alive. That's scripture. Do we agree to that point? So, this is clearly the position of the Bible as relates to the matters of divorce. So I will leave you to answer the question yourself. Is divorce a sin? If divorcing means that you become an adulterer and you go and remarry, you are in adultery. And adultery is a sin. May the Lord give you understanding. Because the Bible is very clear that outside the gate, part of the people you will find outside the New Jerusalem are adulterers. People that will suffer the second death are adulterers. And God is speaking of adultery in the same sentence with divorce. The Christian should be guided. The Christian should be wary. The Christian should remember that marriage is sacred and it is binding. May the Lord give you understanding. <laughs> Welcome back from that video. I know you are blessed in that video. This is Kingdom of TV channel. Please do have to like our video, subscribe to our channel, and click the notification button so you'll be notified whenever we have a video like this. Don't forget to drop your comment, drop your point of view. I pray that the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Amen.